Very good. Okay, now, now, now we're on. Oh, now I don't know which one it is. The red one. Okay. <laughs> um, that's because there's just entirely too much drinking involved in this talk. So, hi, I'm Terrell McSweeney. I am your mystery speaker tonight. Um, I am uh, going to make a presentation about how to hack government. Um, I am not a technologist, I'm not a researcher, and I'm definitely not a hacker. So, uh, just a little bit about what this talk is actually about. And why am I here? I'm going to start with the disclaimers. Um, it's not a tech talk. I'm not dropping any exploits or providing you any useful knowledge about technology. Uh, and I'm, I'm not a hacker or researcher, but I am a former government regulator. So I recently was serving on the US Federal Trade Commission, which is essentially the data protection authority for the United States. It's also an antitrust competition enforcement agency and has been in the news a lot lately because it has a lot of the major US tech companies under orders for previous privacy or data security violations. Um, and I'm also a policy person and a lawyer. But one of the things I've really been working on in the US is incorporating more hackers into policy making. I think the hacker community has incredibly important knowledge that needs to be brought to bear on policymakers. So what I wanted to talk about today was some of the ways we've been doing that and try to convince you that you have a meaningful role to play in helping policymakers understand technology. Red one, okay. I'm gonna be using a lot of Star Wars analogies because of the theme of today, but also because of course I'm a Star Wars fan. So um, this is uh, actually a, an important quote from one of the original uh, human to uh, uh, cyborg relations specialists, C-3PO. Remember that, of course. And these are actually some of the questions that were asked by United States senators recently in hearings uh, that um, were on the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal. Um, this was when Mark Zuckerberg famously was invited to testify before, before the Senate. And, um, you know, so there's some interesting knowledge gaps here. If you're emailing within WhatsApp, for example, so, okay, maybe you just misspoke. Face mash, which was actually, um, wow, there's like a mic now, cool. Um, which was actually a, a joke thing that Mark Zuckerberg ex invented while he was in college. It no longer exists. Um, and this is my favorite question, which was actually by Senator Hatch. Uh, this is um, literally Mark Zuckerberg's expression when it was asked. Um, how do you sustain a business model in which users do not pay for your service? And there's this like pause, if you watch the video of it, and Zuckerberg kind of looks at him with this face as like, is it a trick question? <laughs> or like what? He's like, ads? Is that the answer? Yes, of course it's the answer. So yeah, this is funny. And, I could, and I've actually done versions of this talk before where I had different silly things politicians had said uh, and political leaders had said about technology, it's pretty easy to find. It's a target-rich environment. And it's easy to laugh at it, and I think we should laugh at it a little bit. But what's important to remember is that a lot of our elected officials, it's certainly true in the US government, but I suspect it's true in most governments around the world, are basically normal people who are elected to represent their constituents. And most of their constituents don't know very much about technology either. So none of this should be very surprising to us. But what is really important, I think, is to remember that even though it's a little bit funny that they don't know these things, they are also in the position of writing the laws about them and the laws that not only govern the technology that is everywhere in our lives, but also can have a direct impact on the kind of research and other work that you all are doing in this space. So I think it's important uh, to remember that they have a kind of power and we need to help them use it responsibly. So how do we do that? Uh, this is uh, my, my uh, approximation of the point I was just making. Um, he's holding a thermal detonator. You can imagine it's Senator Hatch who's holding a thermal detonator because he can write a law that could affect just about everything on the internet. So this is a word cloud. I love word clouds because there are a lot of words on this page and it's a funnier way to look at them. But it, it represents a number of the technology policy issues that we're hotly debating, at least in the United States, but that are being debated around the world as well. These include, of course, privacy, data security, cross-border data flow, control, choice, transparency, data portability, interoperability, the security of the IoT, the security of, of stuff that um, some of some 
scholars and others in the US have started calling the internet of bodies, which I think is a really good uh, terminology for medical devices, but also implants and other enhancements that are coming online soon. Government access to data, surveillance, encryption, back doors, whether those are a good idea. I think the hacker community has a huge role to play in explaining the risks of those kinds of technologies and those kinds of mandates from governments. Uh, intellectual property and copyright, which have everything to do with the kind of research that can be done on code and exceptions to those kinds of laws can be incredibly valuable for doing research. Uh, the right to break things, and, and probably just as importantly, uh, the future technologies. Um, cryptocurrency, not so futuristic at this point. Blockchain, increasingly autonomous uh, technology, machine learning, and AI, whether it's specialized or generalized or however you want to think about it. And of course, um, really importantly, how computer crimes are prosecuted and who gets thrown in prison for doing things uh, on computers with code. So th these are all really important policy areas. I suspect that they touch on almost everybody's work in the room, and the people who are in charge of thinking about how to write the laws about them are the people who are asking those questions of Mark Zuckerberg. So if that doesn't sell you on the need to integrate what you know into the policy conversation, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, so, okay, you can, you can uh, argue that, okay, fine, uh, we need to help the government understand these things because the government doesn't really understand them. And, uh, and Gia and I, here I am telling you to engage with policymakers and find people who will listen and whatever. But, uh, but you may feel that this is more or less an impossible assignment and um, that in truth, uh, it, it won't really make any kind of difference. So I wanted to offer a little bit of important hacker history um, that, that sort of makes two points. One, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, this is a photo from May of 1998. This is a time in which the World Wide Web was some, something people surfed mostly on America Online, right? So it was a very different time in, in history. Um, and this is the Loft Group. So this is Mudge and Brian Oblivion, Weld Pond, Space Road, Kingpin, uh, and others who were thinking and working on vulnerabilities at the time. And they were invited to testify. They used their hacker names, which was pretty cool. There's Mudge in the middle who is looking, looking like the dark angel or something. And, in this, and there's some great video of this hearing in which Senator Thompson, who is also a movie star, so he sounds great as a senator, is told like by Mudge, like almost everything that is connected on the internet, we can break and we can totally take everything offline and like about 30 clicks or something, I was, I'm, I'm making it up. And uh, Senator Thompson goes, well, we should fix that. <laughs> like, that's it. like that's it, that's the rejoinder. Okay, so, so, so Congress didn't fix it, obviously. I don't have to tell anybody in the room that we have massive security problems. That's what this entire day is about and all of, all of the conferences around these issues are about. And um, certainly we're continuing to debate how to fix, fix all of the security problems in, in the US. But what did happen after this was the Loft Group decided to start publishing vulnerabilities. And if you think about it, as we fast forward 20 years later, it's now well established that responsible disclosure programs and um, having an ability to respond to vulns when they're disclosed to your organization is a part of good security practice. And in fact, it's a part of good security practice that my former agency, the Federal Trade Commission, has incorporated into its guidelines for what constitutes reasonable security. And all of that comes out of this effort to make a previously relatively invisible world more visible to the people who are thinking about writing laws and making policy. So I, I like this example because I think it shows that of course government moves slowly and of course technology outpaces it. But in fact, um, getting involved at, and, and starting to surface some of the issues and being vocal about them can in fact change industry practice and change best practices even when whole new laws aren't written. So it's important. Um, okay, so um, the, what I wanted to talk about with this slide was essentially the the ways in which um, I've seen really good engagement from the government. Again, I'm using 
a lot of US examples because I'm the most familiar with them. But I suspect that for a lot of folks, um, it is possible to identify the parts of the government that um, are interested in hearing from you. And I suspect those are the parts of the government that look very much like a consumer protection agency or that have a mission that is sort of aligned. So my former agency, the Federal Trade Commission, for example, is, again, primarily a privacy data security enforcement agency, also a competition enforcement agency. It's an agency that protects consumers from unfair deceptive acts and practices in the marketplace, which is a relatively broad mandate. But it has, over time, started to form closer relationships with the research community and with technologists because consumers are using technology in their daily lives and the security of it or the settings that allow them to navigate the privacy on it very much matter in their daily lives. So the FTC, for example, has hired technologists. It also has established its own in-house research shop, OTEC, which can um, create its own research, but importantly, recreate research if it is given uh, information about research or sees a presentation at a conference like this. So that can be very valuable for bringing cases against companies that have insecure practices or are not doing what they purport to be doing with people's data. Uh, but it also has been holding um, conferences. There's an annual conference called PrivacyCon, which invites researchers to come and present new research on both privacy and security. Um, and it's been very successful the last three years. We've added an element to it, which is also bringing in U.S. government agencies that have research funding to do brown bags with researchers so that they can connect directly with folks who can help fund research, and I think that's an important area as well. There's also, around the U.S. government, been a variety of different ways that the government has gotten creative with engaging with hackers. Uh, the digital service, which was started in the Obama administration, which is about bringing technologists into the work of the government in a meaningful way. There was uh, the Office of Technology uh, Science um, in the White House, which actually started having its first chief technology officers, its first chief data scientists, and bringing those kinds of uh, real experts in technology, not, in, not just into the White House, but into every different government agency. There have been challenges that have been run by DARPA, but also the FTC and other agencies. The FTC, for example, ran two challenges at DEF CON to create better tools to fight robocalls, which are those annoying telemarketing calls that bother you uh, all the time. And uh, DARPA ran the Cyber Grand Challenge a couple years ago, which was a cyber autonomous capture the flag game at DARPA, which was terrific. Um, I also just wanted to mention uh, that there are fellowships and now there's a new call to bring a tech advisory group back into Congress, especially following the performance of a lot of the members of Congress during the Facebook hearings. There was a real recognition for the need to bring technological in expertise into that part of the government as well. So what we see in the United States is recognition across the government about the role that technologists need to play and really new models of trying to engage uh, even the, the gray hat hacker community. Um, even the Pentagon now, the Department of Defense is um, running Hack the Pentagon and other um, challenges as well. So I think these are really promising uh, developments and recognitions um, uh, that we're seeing that seen in the US and I suspect we're seeing them in other places as well. So I wanted to make sure that I ended with some really clear takeaways um, because we've been covering a lot of ground. Um, the first one is, uh, you know, I think an important one, which is um, find a way to present your research to policymakers and enforcers. And again, I put, say rep responsibly here because I think uh, all the laws are different. We want to make sure people are not putting themselves in legal jeopardy. But also find the parts of the government that are interested in this information and develop relationships with people in those parts of the government, um, form partnerships with consumer protection and data protection agencies, and help them understand what you know. I think that's a really important element. I, I suspect you'll find a lot of people who are public servants are deeply interested in these areas, and a lot of them are in um, regulatory agencies that are dealing with industries that haven't previously experienced a lot of these problems. So if you think about 
Uh, in the US, for example, the uh, safety administration that regulates vehicles is now thinking about autonomous vehicles. The aviation administration that does planes is thinking about drones. The FDA, which does medical devices, is thinking about IoT. So we see a range of these government agencies that don't have a lot of technological expertise that really need it, and they need it quickly, and they have to get up to speed. So a lot of them are looking for ways to engage. Become a tech translator. Okay, I can't emphasize this enough. Now, that might not be the right role for everybody in the room, but if, uh, if you can explain to your mom what you're working on, then you are qualified to be a tech translator. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, this is a challenge, but, um, but a lot of us, myself included, who um, you know, either have been in positions to influence laws or uh, enforce the laws, don't really know all of the codes and buzzwords of the hacker community. Um, and I think it's awesome to have your own vocabulary and your own language, and I think it's powerful and cool and to have your own community. I think that is also awesome. But remember, if you're trying to explain someone something to someone who is not in that community, help them understand it if you want to have an impact. And if translation is not your thing, then find someone who is a translator and see if you can tell a story about the technology or help them tell that story in a way that people can understand it. Examples are great. Um, real world translations, like I, I loved the, the talk just now about, um, I was thinking like in my head, the internet of yachts, oh my God, rich people problems, <laughs> like, um, which was great. But you know, as you're sitting there thinking about it, the way to translate it is like, hey, um, of all these routers and satellite links on these boats are like super insecure, like they're running like really, really bad security policies and they've got, you know, stuff coded into them that you can't uncode and passwords in plain English, like things mom you wouldn't do yourself at home anymore. Um, so just having a, an ability to kind of explain some of those things sometimes really matters. I've seen this matter also operationally when I've been reviewing companies who have gotten uh, run into problems with the law around their data security practices. Um, very often some uh, cybersecurity personnel or even a CISO explained uh, to relatively high level executives that there was a vulnerability that needed to be patched. Like it was on the OWASP list and then the executive was like, okay, cool, you know, <laughs> they just didn't do anything with that information. That resulted ultimately in a fine from, from an enforcer or a problem, so they should have and they should have known better, but part of, the problem, part of the problem right there was just the translation out of very specialized uh, information into, into more generalized information. So, so this is a vital role and we need to find people who are good at this and deploy them everywhere. And lastly, if that fails, you can always rely on using the force. So I see my time is up, and I wanted to, of course, leave you with the parting wisdom that uh, the laws and regulations and agencies that are enforcing these laws are having a global impact because the internet is a medium that connects us all globally. Our connectedness is growing. Uh, you all have specialized knowledge and skills uh, that are vitally important to protecting com just consumers, individuals, privacy, data, all of these things that are going to matter to us as human beings. And we need to get you into the mix, uh, find parts of the government that you can work with, help people who are policymakers make decisions, and, and speak up as much as possible. Thank you very much.